Good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you from wherever you are. I am based in Dhaka, Bangladesh, uh, and my name is Salim ul -Haq. Please call me Salim. I'm the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development, and it's my uh, pleasure to be with you here at this closing session. We have a lot of very exciting items to come to share with you, but let me just give you an overview uh, to start with of uh, what it is that has just been done. As you know, this is the 15th uh, series in the series of international conferences on community-based adaptation, something I started uh, well over uh, 15 years ago when I was based in IID in London. And I'm very glad to see that it has continued since I've left IID and moved to Bangladesh. And in the last two years, uh, we have actually gone uh, virtual last year's CBA 14 conference and this year's CBA 15, we have done virtually, uh, which has had both its problems, but also potential uh, uh, additional uh, benefits of having much greater participation from all over the world, uh, people not having to fly in uh, to an in-person conference. The theme for this year's conference was local solutions, inspiring global action. And we had five themes within that, one on climate finance, one on innovative uh, uh, for innovation for adaptation, a third on responsive policy, a fourth on nature-based solutions, and uh, a fifth on youth inclusion. And we'll be hearing from each of these theme leaders some of the outcomes of those discussions. But before we do that, let me share with you a video that we've received from Anne-Marie Trevelyan, who is the UK's Minister for State uh, of Business, Energy and Green uh, Growth, uh, but also the champion for adaptation and resilience in the COP26 presidency. Friends and colleagues, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be speaking to you all today. I would like to thank the practitioners, researchers, civil society and grassroots organisations in attendance for their continued leadership on this important agenda. In my role as the UK's International Adaptation and Resilience Champion for COP26, I have spent the last nine months listening to those on the front line about the urgent need for action to respond to climate risks and large-scale biodiversity loss. The impacts are clear. Extreme weather, such as floods and heat waves, and slow onset changes, including sea level rise and desertification, are altering landscapes impacting livelihoods and communities. However, in the face of such adversity, there are countless stories of communities displaying extraordinary ingenuity and innovation in responding and preparing for climate risks. From floating schools in flood prone areas, to changing crop types to be resilient to drought, to improving management of water resources. I recently had the honour of meeting the Maleku indigenous community in Costa Rica, hearing of their challenges in the face of climate change. These encounters will always stay with me. I am here to stand with those at the forefront of climate change and to be their people's champion. In doing so, I want to provide a platform for stories of resilience from women and girls, young people, indigenous people and people living with disabilities to be told at COP. Collectively, we are all on a journey to scale out adaptation action to ensure that everyone is resilient to current and future climate risks. We know that effective adaptation requires local leadership. So enabling more locally led adaptation informed by inclusive plans is a critical part of what we as a presidency are seeking to catalyze to continue through to the African presidency at COP27. In supporting the LDC initiative for effective adaptation and resilience program, we recognise that countries and local communities are the experts in determining how to prepare for climate change. And they ought to have the autonomy to make decisions on building their resilience. The launch of principles for locally led adaptation at the Climate Adaptation Summit, signed by over 40 governments, global institutions and local and international NGOs, provide a framework for how adaptation can be delivered more effectively. Through the Adaptation Action Coalition and the High Level Champions Race to Resilience, 
we will hold a set of regional dialogues encouraging both state and non-state actors to champion the principles of locally-led action and develop domestic capabilities to transform how adaptation action is both planned and implemented. This means building domestic systems, empowering marginalised groups to be part of decision making and ensuring that finance is accessible to those who need it most. At the Climate and Development Ministerial, we launched the Task Force on Access to Climate Finance. With Fiji and other parties, we will align programmatic support behind national climate plans to improve local level access to financial flows. Research additionally needs to be locally driven addressing the needs of local communities. And the Adaptation Research Alliance, launched at the Gobeshena Conference, is encouraging the adaptation research community to endorse its research principles to carry out action-oriented research that responds to local needs. In our path to COP, partnerships between local communities, governments and business at a national level and international links to multilateral development banks and climate funds need to be harnessed and solidified. I'm excited for what we can deliver and look forward to collaboratively working ahead of COP26 and beyond to deliver more effective locally led adaptation action. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anne, for that uh, uh, excellent uh, set of remarks. And we look forward to collaborating with you in your capacity as the champion for adaptation and resilience of the COP26 presidency, and we hope that we'll be able to feed into the COP26 discussions on adaptation, particularly the agenda item on the global goal on adaptation, which is causing quite a lot of excitement in the uh, scientific arena on this. Uh, so uh, I'm go going to be handing over in a moment uh, to my colleague Aditya Bahadur from IID, who will be running a, a hard talk type uh, talk show uh, with a number of our part, uh, theme leaders from the different themes that I mentioned earlier. This will then be followed after that by the results of the Dragon's Den uh, competition that we had, where we had pitches from a number of uh, individuals with some excellent ideas, and that will be uh, presented and the winners will be announced. And then I will be concluding with a panel discussion where we have some very excellent uh, panelists uh, who I will ask to reflect on the outcomes of the CBA 15 conference and what their their personal takeaways would be uh, from what they hear. So without further ado, let me hand over to uh, Aditya Bahadur to run the hard talk session. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. A uh, very warm welcome to another edition of Hard Talk. I'm your host, Aditya Bahadur, and this is the Adaptation Broadcasting Company. Today, we have five expert panelists, each of whom who has owned, led, and shepherded one of the five conference themes. Over the next 20 minutes, they're going to explain what they learned and why their themes matter. To begin with, we're going to give each of our panelists two minutes to explain the key takeaways from their theme over the, uh, over the various days of the conference. And then you can judge for yourself whether they've really pushed the boundaries of knowledge further or not. I want to assert that Salim Bhai has given me only 20 minutes for this hard talk. And therefore the CBA has invested in a very high tech time management system this year. As soon as two minutes are up for the first round of questions, I'm gonna put up this post-it in front of my camera uh, and I expect whoever's speaking to kindly stop at that point. With that, I'm going to turn to our first panelist, Obed Goringo. You work with Care International and you shepherded and led the theme on responsive policy. Over to you for your two minutes to share your key messages with our audience today. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Aridia. And uh, my name is Obed Goringo and I was the theme lead for responsive policy, which dis was discussing on how policy from local to global can be refocused uh, so as to uh, prioritize local led action and local knowledge. But we had very good discussions and some of the key messages that came out. Uh, one is on 
how urban poor and grassroots women networks have existing innovative strategies and solutions to various disasters and pandemics such as COVID-19 and climate related challenges, which need to be resourced and scaled through partnership and collaboration. Uh, developing the leadership capacities and agency and networks of women should receive special attention to be able to make them agents of change and ensure that climate change responses more effectively meet the needs of uh, women and, women and men. Uh, in bridging the gap between indigenous knowledge and evolve local government decision making, solutions must in, uh, involve devolving power from national level governments to more localized governance institutions and putting in place affirmative action programs to be able to ensure that local people or indigenous knowledge holders have the capacity to effectively own and govern these localized institutions and implement their own self-determined governance systems while working in partnership with the government. Loss and damage was also another key issue that was discussed in this theme. And due to climate, loss and damage due to climate change impact is heavily impacting millions of local communities, especially women, men, uh, IPs, and, and, and children. Yes, yet it is not a priority agenda in the international conventions. So there's really an urgent need for our leaders to develop a clear plan to ensure action on loss and damage, uh, including making climate finance accessible at local level while ensuring that this finances prioritize approaches designed with strong involvement and led by local uh, vulnerable communities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Obed. You're almost exactly on time, a tough act to follow. For Susan Nanduru, who works with the African Center for Trade and Development and has led the theme on innovation for adaptation. Susan, the floor is yours for exactly two minutes. I'll try to meet the challenge. Thank you very much. And um, so Susan, I was team lead with Chris Henderson and it was around the innovation theme. So beyond the technologies that are widely known to represent innovation, we explored the need to, and I'll speak to the four points, innovate in the recognition of indigenous knowledge and its use. We agree it's very important. It comes from generations before us. It has enabled our existence and has a lot of potential to build resilience in the future. But how do we support it? How can it be financed and used effectively um, in the context that we are in, where, for instance, donors uh, have strong commitments towards scale and the, the demands uh, that they have, community groups, indigenous groups may not have the capacity to meet. So um, there were lots of discussions that suggest that we need partnerships. Um, intermediaries are important, but around partnerships, it's very important to build respect and put the indigenous communities at the center of any designs um, uh, for, for adaptation actions. Moving on to innovations in the utilization of citizen generated data by urban authorities. There was a lot of recognition of the power of the community generated data and how valuable it is for planning and that in uh, the urban authorities often utilize political incentives for decision making. So how do we as a community ensure that the community-led data is recognized and utilized by the local authorities and other partners? Um, uh, so that is still our challenge. Um, but we had lots of examples on how many communities in urban areas are utilizing different approaches to mobilize generate data. And <clears throat> we need capacity building to ensure to support the communities uh, link bridge that gap with the partners, um, including governments. The third area was innovating in sustaining adaptation actions. 
through partnerships, um, partnerships that work. We recognize the, the importance of building partnerships from the very beginning, partnerships that will integrate private sector and government. Private sector because um, over the years we have seen that working in silos does not lead to sustainability, but there is a lot of value. As long as you show private sector that there is value for them to make money and um, support, in, uh, it's supporting, right. yeah, I'm just trying to get right. time. Susan, apologies, <laughs> you're a minute over, so I'd be grateful if you could wrap up. Okay, so just one more point um, that we need in terms of scaling the utilization of climate information services, we need to put the communities at the center in the design and uh, spreading of the information services for it to work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barry Smith, you're up next. You're a researcher with the uh, Climate Change Group at the IIED. Policy researchers have many virtues. Brevity, unfortunately, is not one of them. <laughs> so um, please do keep that in mind. OK, I'll try my best. And it does feel crudely reductive to try and boil down just a few points. The quite a rich and challenging discussion from the climate finance team, but I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. And I think there has been quite a lot of commonality with other teams, um, particularly around partnership, for example. That came up quite a lot. But uh, let me dive into the key messages from the sessions. So from the first session, um, which we focus on BRAC's Climate Bridge Fund, one of the messages which came out was that local NGOs and partner organisations, whilst they lack the capacity to apply for and then implement uh, projects, there are other organisations that can help them overcome these challenges. So with this in mind, funding can focus on not just capacity building, which does remain vital, but also coalition building and coordination with other organisations with the relevant experience. Donors and intermediaries need to rethink their role. It's not just about the provision of grant finance. They need to also act as brokers to help local actors network and build partnership with the organizations and make the connections that they actually need. And finally, from that session, donors need to rethink their appetite for risk, get comfortable risk or things aren't gonna change. From the second session, uh, local efforts on finance and climate adaptation and risk reduction, which was lessons from Asia and Africa, um, ensuring finance reaches local level isn't just a funding issue, it's a governance issue. To make best use of the finance, communities and local governments need to have the networks, skills and knowledge to access, fund and design programmes. But for this to be possible, capacity bridging needs to explicitly be included in the design and implementation, and they need to provide longer term financing. Strengthening governance takes quite a lot of time, so it needs to be uh, provided over longer term. Uh, catalytic seed funding at the community level is provided, has proved to be effective. Uh, and it's, again, it's a great way to build partnerships with wider stakeholders that can support adaptation. But to scale solutions for longer term investments, communities need to be equipped with the information and the skills for funding. Um, so moving on, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting two signals here. Um, gender and social inclusion, are, are crucial when discussing planning and implementing innovation and approaches for innovative finance solutions for um, ecosystem-based adaptation. And again, something which came out from a lot of the sessions was that monitoring, evaluation, learning is a critical component, um, and that needs to uh, really be integrated into the design and the implementation of projects. And it, it can be a way to catalyze access to novel sources of finance, for example, from promoting other cross-sectoral collaborations. Uh, so I will stop Thank you. here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. Alexandra Amrin, you work with the GIZ and you led the theme on nature-based solutions. Uh, do take yourself off mute. The floor is yours for exactly two minutes. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Alexandra and I work for the global mainstreaming EBA project at GIZ and yeah we hosted the theme on NBS. We had three sessions on NBS um, and all pursued the question of how local communities can drive NBS for resilient food systems and they did that from different angles. 
one from, um, from the communication side on understanding the effectiveness of um, EBA, another one on the local, on the um, knowledge systems, local, traditional and scientific, and another one on how um, communities can be put in the driver's seat of planning and implementation. And yeah, here are the key messages. So um, bottom up project planning and implementation. Consultations are not enough. We need genuine participation, but this also means allowing projects time to understand the diversity of communities' interests, needs, and capacities. And often this directly co is conflicted by donors' expectations to implement ready-made solutions from day zero of the project timeline. It was also highlighted that collaborating with local organizations that not, does not necessarily mean that a community-based approach is in place. Another message is on customized communication, that we need to customize our messages to diverse audiences and our communication about EBA and NBS needs to be digestible and humanized. And it needs to be connected to people's daily lives and um, the needs of our audiences. And this means making abstract ideas concrete and knowing and understanding what our audiences need. Um, the last message is on knowledge. That we need to break down the hierarchy of knowledge and enable a paired dialogue. The different contributions to science and to society must be identified and regarded as, as an, at an equal level. That each knowledge system has valuable aspects to add to the discourse and the hierarchy between knowledge system is artificial and counterproductive. We need a mechanism to bring knowledge systems together to create an integrated form of new knowledge. That's it. Thank you, Alexandra. You win the prize for the most um, prompt um, <laughs> uh, panelist. I'll go to our last expert, Sakib Haq. You work with the International Center for Climate Change and Development in uh, Bangladesh, and you led the theme on youth inclusion. Um, two minutes are yours. Thank you, Aditya. So uh, my colleagues and I, we had quite a lot of uh, interesting session applications under the youth inclusion theme. So we've tried to uh, get some sessions at this year's CBA that were a, lot, a bit more broad, that helped us to understand a bit more of the societal and systemic issues, and then break down into some interesting conversations, which are some of the key messages that I'd like to share now. So really one of the key messages that we've come to is capacity building is a chronic problem, but it's something that's been seen as more of a top-down approach where we're sort of delivering capacity down to the communities, which is of course necessary, but over our conversations of the, the sessions this year, what we've really come to learn is that it needs to be more of a two-way street. Capacity building needs to also not only work with the youth, giving them the tools and, and some of the skills to be able to break into policies, break into decision-making circles, giving them the climate uh, knowledge that is required, but also with policymakers, giving them some capacity building to recognize youth as a, as a vital stakeholder themselves making them uh, realize that the youth are somebody that they should be approaching and engaging with uh, more intensively which then leads us to one of our other key messages about building long-term uh, partnerships so having more credible partnerships with all the stakeholders that are invested particularly with the youth who have again a, a credibility issue in terms of uh, attending these decision making meetings when they're there it's more of a token uh, representative that's there but not really somebody that has a say in the planning in the processes and in particular on policies and budgets, which is something that the youth have some uh, really big challenges in terms of making any impacts with. So then that leads us to providing more supportive finance for youth, which is something that we've seen for quite a lot of youth activities is something that they get awarded from competitions, but they're really minimal amounts, $100 as a prize winner or $500, but nothing that really helps them be able to take their activities and their actions forward in a more meaningful way. And then the final message is, just for everybody to sort of realize that the youth, particularly the youth in vulnerable areas, are agents. They're not somebody that is sort of an end process as a token in a meeting, just having a youth a representative come and make a speech, but being able to capacity build with them, build these partnerships, providing some supportive finance to these institutions really helps them to be agents, be the bridge between uh, communities and policymakers, as well as researchers and intermediaries like us. So hopefully those are some interesting messages. And after the CBA conference, there'll be more about how we can unpack these and work ahead. Back to you. Thank you very much, Sakib. I want to keep you on the screen, on the spotlight, please, while I have you. Um, you know, we've worked together on many projects. I know you have a lot of experience. Really think hard and tell me one or two new things that you learned 
as a result of your engagement at CBA? Um, I, I wouldn't say they're new, but they're things that I found pleasantly surprising over CBA this year is that A, it, the level of enthusiasm, it just doesn't wane for youth groups. You know, every year there are more and more youth that are wanting to be engaged, wanting to set up their own um, projects. And there are some of the youth speakers that we had over this year. There are youth that have set up their own organizations. There are youth that are establishing their own networks. And that really is something that is encouraging to see. They're incredibly resourceful. And one other thing that I would say is that they're incredibly time aware. They're, they're aware of how much needs to be done and how little time we have to be able to make impacts on that. So those, I think, are some really encouraging lessons about engaging with youth in these communities so that we're really able to make a meaningful impact come through. Great, thanks. Alexandra, if I can bring you back in. Um, so imagine that you're in an elevator and you find yourself um, next to the president or prime minister of a vulnerable country. You have about two minutes till she or he reaches their destination. What is your pitch to get them to take nature-based solutions seriously? Why should they care? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I hope I'd be lucky enough to ever meet a president in, in an elevator. And if so, I hope I have the courage to say the following. Don't wait any longer. We are in a climate and biodiversity crisis right now. There's considerable amount of climate change and biodiversity collapse that we won't be able to stop, even if all countries commit, reach their commitments. Being particularly vulnerable, you must prioritize adaptation to climate change above all else. Protect and rebuild your natural capital. It is the foundation of your children's and grandchildren's well-being. Believe in your ancestors' wisdoms and your people that work the land every day. Question the quick technological fix. Instead, work with nature rather than against it. Invest in ecosystem-based and natural solutions. They're more resilient and cheap in the long run. And you will find resources and tools and communities and networks around the world willing to help you with this endeavor. And the CBA is one of them. Thanks, Alexander. That was, that was suspiciously articulate. And we've reached our store. <laughs> you reached, you reached your store. One new insight that you gained at CBA that you did not have before? Um, yeah, it's not completely new, but just understanding again that NBS is a topic that excites and mobilizes many people. It's a term that people identify with. Um, at the same time, we still have a lot of other terms around it, and there's sometimes a bit of confusion between NBS, EBA, CBA, um, so that came out quite clearly. So we may need um, some yeah, clarification on that without getting lost in the definition because that's just distracting us from action. Um, another thing I learned again is just the power of multidisciplinary dialogue because in such short times in the breakout groups, we managed to came up with a, an amazing wealth of ideas and different thoughts and approaches and that is just really remarkable. Great. Thank you, Alexandra. Barry, I'll bring you in. Uh, I know you have friends in high places, so it's quite likely that you'll find yourself in an elevator with a president or prime minister. You have 45 seconds. It's quite a, not a very tall building. Um, over to you. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip it. I'm in an elevator with a head of state from a developed country. And her government hasn't really been fulfilling the, the promise that she made. So I've, I have three things I would say. First up, be more transparent and accountable to the communities that the finance is supposed to serve. Provide better quality, publicly available information on the finance you're providing. Be brave and hold yourself to account. Secondly, communities know what they're doing. Your job is to provide seed funding for climate adaptation programs at the community level that have already proved to work. Be catalytic. Thirdly, there's an asymmetry of information. Donors and intermediaries need to level the playing field by ensuring the right information is transmitted to and received by the communities on the ground in a usable format. They need to be armed with the knowledge and the skills on the funding access and program design 
by practitioners, local government, or by peer-to-peer -peer learning. Ding, Go, reach the bottom floor. M Mr. Smith, firstly, I don't know how you got past my security. <laughs> Secondly, your suggestion sounds ludicrous. If we give all the money that we have for dealing with climate change to local communities, how will we know how it's being spent? What is your recommendation for ensuring accountability if you're sending all the money down to the local level? Well, so this came out quite strongly for me across all of the climate finance session. I think it's been echoed elsewhere. It's the importance of MEL. And it's the importance of operationalizing the learning element. Now, I think the importance of MEL is something which is generally accepted. But from the sessions, I heard a lot that projects must engage local communities in participatory MEL activities from the very beginning and really integrate their learning and their information needs throughout the project cycle. Now, this is learning which is properly operationalized and it's going to move beyond accountability and it's engaging local actors. But this is going to benefit the donors. Donors can harness local knowledge of what does and doesn't work. So the information can be cascaded upwards. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Smith. I'll take that. Um, I'll think about that and, and we'll see what happens. You know, I'm not fully convinced yet. Let's see if the audience of the CBA is. Um, uh, <laughs> I'll ask uh, Susan to come into the spotlight now, please. Susan, I found your opening remarks really interesting and I think there was so much pith there, um, but I really want to put you in the spot now and ask you about the top three things that added to your existing knowledge on this topic of innovation for adaptation. What are one or two things that you really learned through your interaction through this conference? So the emphasis of having the communities at the center before doing anything the top-down nature of solutions is not working, it's not sustainable. So we need them in the design of technologies, including um, climate information services. That will go a long way. The second is the indigenous knowledge um, has to be brought at the center and donors have to pay attention. They have to listen, they have to learn um, and also support the fact that this indigenous knowledge which is being lost very fast needs to be produced into other formats so that we don't lose it. So we need digital ways of uh, um, keeping the knowledge and learning from it and using it in the future. The third, it's not new, maybe all of this is not new, but we still need to pay a lot of attention to capacity, capacity needs. Yeah, those three. Right. So Susan, when I'm not uh, being the primetime TV host, I work with uh, something called the Adaptation Research Alliance, which mm -hmm. is a big new global effort to step up the level of ambition on action research on uh, adaptation. They too have a strong emphasis on ensuring that different streams of knowledge, knowledge inform adaptation actions. But the pathways of making sure the mecha mechanisms of making that happen are still not clear. Was there any discussion on how can you actually include insights from indigenous communities in adaptation decision making? Um, oh, yes. Um, so, so, so we need to, there are insights uh, in terms of bringing their indigenous groups onto the decision making table. We also learned that um, in, in bringing partnerships together. Actually partnerships at the beginning that bring every um, different players together, including researchers, including the private sector, very, very critical in first listening and synthesizing the knowledge, the information that the indigenous knowledge have, which actually they share through their lived experiences, not our jargon of climate change then we translate that into decision-making. I think that came out quite strongly. Thank you, Susan, thanks for that. Um, our, our final speaker today is Obed Koringo. Please come into the spotlight, Obed. Again, I found your opening remarks uh, really interesting, but similar to Barry, what if you find yourself in an elevator with the president of Kenya? What will you be your 45 second pitch 
on making policies more responsive? If, if I was with the president uh, of Kenya, if I have that privilege, <clears throat> and uh, based on the discussions that came out of the responsive policy, this is what I will say. Integrating learning from local knowledge is very crucial in, in the formulation and implementation of inclusive policies that build the resilience of the most vulnerable groups. And while these vulnerable communities uh, are in the front line of climate change impact, they are rarely involved and have not, don't have a voice in prioritizing decision making and implementing the action that uh, most affect them. The discussion at CBA 15 have revealed that local communities, including youth and women, are already using their indigenous knowledge and local resources to develop working solutions to the challenges facing them. It's therefore paramount to recognize and listen to these grassroots communities on what they actually need and not what we think they need by including them in the decision-making tables so as to advocate for themselves and to contribute their local experiences to policy-making processes in order to deliver more adaptation action at the local level. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Korengo. I'm getting late uh, for my meeting, but I have a quick question from you. Uh, climate change is a big global problem. Don't we need global and national solutions to this uh, cross-cutting issues? What will individual local communities be able to do about it? Yes, we need uh, in global and local solutions. And there's, there's need to be able to um, involve local communities in defining, defining their own uh, the needs and priorities in, in, in both local and national policies. And uh, it's not just enough to talk about uh, how grassroots communities should be involved, but actually providing them with an avenue to be able to share their, their stories and advocate for themselves in what matters most because they have solutions with them and have homegrown experiences and strategies that work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all the time we have for the show this evening. Um, I'm going to go back to our producer, Sam Green, over to you. Thanks very much, Aditya, for those uh, tough questions and to all of the theme leads for uh, sharing and summarizing um, uh, the, the outcomes of your discussions over the last few weeks. I want to uh, now turn it over to the audience. We have a large number of people sitting here and really we want to know what is it that you think? So we're going to go now to Mentimeter and this is for you who are in the session and any of you who are watching on the live stream as well. Uh, I'm going to share with you my screen, uh, which will include uh, the code. So if you want to go to menti.com and use the code, which is loading now, 75482077, you can do that on your phone or you can do it by opening another browser window. Enter that code, 75482077. And in any way that you want to phrase them, of the messages that you've heard this morning, which are the biggest priorities? Which ones do you think we need to be talking about the most? And you can answer more than once. So feel free to throw in a few different ones and keep them coming. And we're going to use these as part to feed into our messaging. So we've got funding coming up. We've heard lots this morning about citizen-led data, about integrating local and particularly indigenous knowledge has come out really strongly. Um, okay, some answers coming in thick and fast now. This is really exciting. So more accessible funding uh, has come up a couple of times. Building clear and strong links between local communities and national governments. Yes, I think that, that vertical integration has come out strongly. Great, keep them coming in, including local communities from the beginning, regardless if it is in a project planning, monitoring, or a new funding opportunity. Monitoring, evaluation, and learning, again, can support evidence and decision-making and increase the participation of communities. Great, Mel coming up strongly over and over again, which is uh, uh, really exciting and something that we didn't hear so much last year, so it's great to get that in. Indigenous knowledge recognition, yes, coming up a few times as well. 
do keep them coming in. You can answer more than once. Getting meaningful finance in the hands of local communities. Uh, coming through the climate finance theme there, absolutely. And one here about young people not being included just as tokens, but supported fully and empowered in long-term projects. So this is great. So do please keep those coming in and you're welcome to keep submitting them uh, uh, as we continue to go through the session today with anything that you hear. We will use these and we'll feed them into the way that we communicate our messages in the future. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go through. So thanks so much for your contributions. Like I said, please do keep feeding those in uh, uh, so that we can keep them and use them as a, as a starting point for uh, uh, things that we produce and indeed for Gabeshina and next year's CBA. So I'm going to stop this screen share now and I'm going to hand over to Jesper, who has led the Dragon's Den uh, theme uh, Jasper Hornberg is with the Global Re Resilience Partnership. Jasper, over to you. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen now. It's always a bit exciting to see if it works. We, uh, we have, uh, together with IUCN uh, and GRP, is, is co-hosting uh, the Dragon's Den um, uh, for the first, uh, uh, well, we've done it several, several times uh and um have um uh, done so again this year we had an exciting cohort of of uh, uh entrepreneurs and, and community representatives um uh, and it's always such a, a a pleasure to work with these guys and see what they come up with again this year we had uh, um, a number of of pitchers uh, and we had a um a pretty tough uh, process uh, selecting them uh, we do this with um, uh, um, the help of dragons, and now I'm, I'm hopefully sharing my, my screen. We can uh, see that, yeah. Okay, good. Um, and um, uh, we had a distinguished uh, uh, panel this year. We had uh, Kojanan, uh, who um, uh, brings a lot of experience from the philanthropic, uh, philanthropic world, um, as well as uh, impact investing. We had the pleasure of having a previous winner with us, uh, Doris, uh, great. She won in Addis when we did the same thing. Uh, we had Edith Kiss, uh, an investment and development director, uh, also bringing investment uh, experience and asking really potent questions. And, and finally, we had uh, Adam Bornstein, who is um, uh, working with uh, innovation and finance and uh, systems change at the Danish Red Cross. Also, someone who, who uh, tells you to do that he will do crazy stuff and then he goes and do them, uh, does them. Uh, he goes and do them. Ah, sorry. Um, we um, um, uh, went through this process. It was pretty tight. We had a, a couple of, of uh, strong contenders, uh, but we finally, and I'm happy to see that this person is online. Uh, we finally arrived at uh, uh, Waste to Watts with uh, Chikumbutso Kilembe uh, as the winner. So I would, uh, I'm not gonna talk anymore now. Uh, I will ask him to unmute and uh, very briefly if I give you two, three minutes, uh, go through uh, what it is that you do so that the whole audience here can, uh, can listen in. Good afternoon and thank you so much. And I'm very excited to be announced winner of the Dragon's Day in Pitch. Uh, my project, uh, the proposal is to do something on waste management and uh, other aspects of uh, uh, energy generation as well as uh, provision of fertilizer. So the way this model, or uh, the way the pitch went, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, uh, quickly. I, I, I can't wait for the Embassy of Ireland in Longwe, uh, and where my inspiration came from uh, to, to do something on waste management uh, is when we had promotion of energy solutions for the poor, culminating in the achievement of 2 million cook stoves by 2020, uh, a commitment that Malawi did uh, a, a few years back. If we could go then to the next slide. So the problem that I, um, I, I, I found is that there's poor waste management in Longwe City, there's lack of waste segregation uh, uh, and to support value addition to waste. And there is also a charcoal problem, increased use of unsustainable illegal charcoal mostly in urban areas and there's also low agricultural production due to poor soil fertility by smallholder farmers. So realizing these problems, there's a solution that I put forward, going to the next slide. And this solution is uh, to 
to initiate improved waste collection methods, which would include segregation of waste. And from the waste, especially organic waste, to produce biogas uh, from food waste as well as from restaurants. And then once the biogas produced, sell back to them, and as well as the uh, liquid fertilizer. If we could go to the next slide. Uh, our value proposition is that biogas can uh, substitute both charcoal and LPG. LPG in Malawi is mostly imported and is subject to price fluctuations and charcoal mostly is outlawed in Malawi because it's, it's legally produced most of it. So biogas has a lot of value in this respect. And in terms of waste collection, uh, waste collection, uh, better waste collection in Longwe City and other cities can be an enabler of other businesses i.e. recycling uh, into bricks and other, uh, other recycling methods that can be employed. So that's a, a, a plus. And uh, thirdly, liquid fertilizer could be a game changer in Malawi because it can reduce the burden that is there on the uh, current fertilizer subsidy program. So that's why we're proposing this. So the next slide, please, uh, is that we want to have at least 120,000 US dollars to invest in a biogas plant. So this biogas plant would ensure that we solve these three problems that I've mentioned uh, previously. So that's the budget. And we are very excited that this pitch was uh, chosen and it's something that excited the dragons. Uh, would want to make sure that this uh, dream is made a reality. So. Uh, whatever support we can get to have this uh, road into motion will be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. And I'm very excited to be chosen winner of uh, the Dragon's Den pitch. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, well, with that, we, we look forward to the next, uh, next session next year. Um, and I hand back over to Sam. Thanks so much and uh, congratulations uh, to the winner and, and uh, uh, congratulations also to all the other uh, uh, contestants that took part. It's not easy to develop a pitch in three or four days and the ones that I saw were, were, were fantastic. So I'm going to hand back over to Salim now who's going to introduce our panel and take us into the next stage. Thanks very much. Thank you very much uh, Sam and Jesper for that excellent session and back and Aditya as well. It's my pleasure now to uh, moderate a session with four very distinguished speakers from four different continents, as it happens. Uh, the first one is Mr. Andrew Jackson, who is the Deputy Director of the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office, uh, Climate and Environment Department uh, from the UK. Uh, second, we have Azul Schwartzman, who is the Youth Fellow for the Race to Resilience, uh, who is from Argentina. Uh, and then we have Ashmita Oja, who's from Mercy Corps and she's from Nepal. And last but not least, Sarah Nandudu, who's with the Slum Dwellers International in Uganda. So uh, I'm going to ask each of them for uh, opening uh, comments uh, to reflect a little bit about what they have heard coming out of the CBA 15 conference resonates with the work that they do in their own organizations and their countries, and what are the messages they'd be like they'd be taking back to their own work in terms of uh, mainstreaming it or incorporating it or sharing it with colleagues and taking it forward. And I'll start with Andrew Jackson. Thank you very much, Salim, and uh, thank you very much for the, the invitation uh, to join this panel today. And uh, um, and then the greeting to distinguished colleagues and everybody listening. It really has been inspiring listening to uh, the interventions and some of the discussions that's been going on. And we're clearly drawing on such a rich pool of uh, ideas and, and knowledge. Um, I think really three things um, for me um, that the, the presentations that we've heard have underlined um, how important the whole adaptation space is and why it's so fundamental to um, our preparations as incoming president for, for COP26 this year. Um, you've, um, you've, you've shown how, how drawing on local knowledge, which we've understood um, for a long time is really fundamental um, to successful adaptation, um, how we can take this to another level by drawing on such a rich pool of experience. And I think this is one of the most important things 
uh, that I take away. And if I underline three things, and you heard some of this from Anne-Marie Trevelin um, in her presentation, um, in the preparation for the COP26, um, we've wanted to draw on the, the role of um, uh, states through the Adaptation Action Coalition that was launched at the um, adaptation, uh, Climate Adaptation Summit at the start of the year. Um, and we've made the, the principles for locally led adaptation um, one of the areas that we can focus on there um, alongside the race to resilience. Um, and one of the things that we will be doing in the coming weeks is having a series of regional conversations that digs deeper into, uh, into the themes that you've been discussing. Um, we've also seen how we need to make sure that um, national planning um, links up with the, the national and the local level. And this has been an area that we've been emphasizing um, in, the, in the preparation for the, the COP26 as well. Um, and, uh, and then when it comes to finance and the access to finance, the access to finance task force that's been created after the climate and development ministerial meeting which took place earlier this year, um, again, is an opportunity to look at new approaches to access, including how we link those to national planning systems. Um, you've also reinforced the, the importance um, of the Adaptation Research Alliance that was launched at the beginning of this year to really catalyze um, action oriented research, collaboration between uh, universities and the church institutions that strengthens capacity building. And all of these things together, um, I think will help achieve the goal that um, Amory Trevelyan mentioned, that we want to bring the stories of what works um, to the, the COP26 so that we can be building on those. Um, the second point um, I think is to, to reinforce what we learned from things that we've already been doing. And um, uh, a lot of people listening will be familiar with the BRACE program, the Building Resilience and Adaptation to Climate Extremes and Disasters, which was, which was one of the programs that the UK supported um, that really helped um, deepen the knowledge of, of what we can do through locally led adaptation. It led, for example, to a model of county climate change funds um, in Kenya, um, bringing finance down to a local level in Nepal, um, the Anakulam program, program, putting farmers groups at the, the center of decision making. Um, and these things have also then fed into uh, the Life AR program that we're supporting at the moment, the Least Developed Countries Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience. Um, and I think that the, the discussions that you've been having um, helps us translate into practical actions through platforms like Life AR, which will have its own learning platform. Um, it will be a global platform um, to, uh, with the goal of uh, ensuring that at least 70% of finance supports local action by 2030. So these ideas feed into this um, as well. Um, and then picking very briefly on wanting that inclusive approach, the, the emphasis on really hearing from youth, from women, um, and um, on that, in the, in the run-up to the COP26, we, we have the COP26 Civil Society and Youth Advisory Council, um, with I Italy hosting the Youth for Climate events, um, the initiatives to support the, the UNFCCC's Gender Action Plan. I think what you're doing with the, the locally led ad adaptation um, is, is demonstrating how we can um, really make those rich and meaningful um, and bring together as wide a participation as possible. Um, the, alongside the, thing, the points that I've mentioned there, the, the Nature Campaign um, is a vehicle which helps us understand uh, better the ecosystem-based adaptation, um, but also, as was mentioned this morning, how we draw on the best of Indigenous knowledge um, and science-based knowledge in adaptation. And these are all themes that we'll be really wanting to, to take forward. Um, I think it's fair to say as well, one of the reasons that it's so helpful is that sometimes, and, and, and some of your, your presenters picked up on this, it's not easy um, to actually work out how to deliver this. We recognize and we recognize for a long time um, the importance of the local leadership in, in delivery. Um, and so by bringing together um, your participants, the ideas that come from here um, into the future discussions, we're able to work together to see how we make that bridge, bringing together the different groups, national level researchers, um, businesses, private sector, and the local level um, to deliver this, this change on the ground. So as Amri Trevelyan said, um, you're actually illustrating some really quite exciting opportunities that we want to, to build on. 
Um, I think the areas around innovation, innovation, um, not just in terms of technologies, early warning system, things that we can use, but innovations in ways of working um, are, are really things that we can, we can build on. Um, I'll leave it there. Yes, uh, I hope we have a chance to come back to you uh, again. Uh, I will just uh, uh, seed a question for the second round, uh, which is about the COP26 agenda on adaptation, where we hope to discuss the uh, agreement in the Paris Agreement to set up a global goal on adaptation, but we haven't done so yet. Uh, uh, you know, what, what are we thinking about that? In particular, how do we bring in local voices into establishing such a global goal? Is it just a top-down affair or can we have a bottom-up approach to a global goal as well? So I leave you to think about that and come back to you, I hope, uh, in a few minutes. Let me now move on to Azul Schwarzman, who is from Argentina and is a, a, a fellow of the Youth Fellow of the Race to Resilience. Azul, would you like to tell us a little bit more about what you do and then answer the question of what have you heard from the CDA uh, conference that you think will be useful to you going back to the work that you are doing? Azul, you have the floor. Thank you, Salim. Thank you, everyone, for inviting us. Um, as Salim was saying, I'm one of the Youth Fellows in Resilience in the High Level Champions team. And I work alongside with another uh, youth fellow in the youth engagement aspect of the race to resilience. Now back to what everything that's been said uh, during the past hour and also during this week and hearing all about the work that has been done these past days, um, for me, it becomes even more clear that we must embed resilience into recovery plans and make 2021 a year of action on climate resilience and mitigation. Uh, we need to mobilize more resources towards locally-led adaptation, creating more collaborative spaces for actors who can build the resilience of vulnerable communities of climate change. Having said this, I feel that most of what was brought here is very aligned with the work that we are doing in Race to Resilience. For those of you who haven't heard about this campaign, Race to Resilience is a global effort that puts people and nature at the center, uh, something that CBA has certainly spotlighted during this week. The ambition of the campaign is to build resilience in 4 billion people by 2030, but start acting today. Uh, in the sense, Race to Resilience has currently 21 initiatives whose programs operate in over uh, 80 countries. Um, in this sense, the more we can demonstrate ambition from non-state actors, and this is something that has been done uh, in this past week and today, the more we can raise the level of ambition and action from state actors. Then I would like to share a couple of thoughts that relate to some of the key messages that you've been working throughout the week, specifically about my topic, which is youth engagement. Um, during these past days, from what I've heard today, you've raised some very valid points. Uh, for instance, that while there are youth inclusion tracks in place to engage youth at COP itself and on the road to COP, um, like it was just mentioned, uh, these mechanisms are still not fully adequate reaching and representing communities on the ground, particularly the most vulnerable youth uh, in the face of climate change. Another point you've also raised was that to be effective, uh, youth networks require funding and strong partnerships, uh, and young people must be involved in minim meaningful and equitable and high-level decision-making spaces, rather than just being tokenistic additions or excluded from uh, these spaces where real change and real decisions are being made. Let me say that I definitely agree with both points. And this is a fight that we still need to give in international decision-making uh, spheres, but luckily, and to shed some hope, uh, there are some good prototypes of meaningful youth um, engagement and participation that are starting to arise. For instance, the fellowship, which I am part of, that the high level champions launched last year was born out of similar concerns. Today, I am here engaging with you, working directly with operationalizing race to resilience and gaining leadership skills, while with the other youth fellows, we're also starting to set the basis of the future of this program. So what I'm trying to say is that there are some really good prototypes and some really good opportunities for youth to meaningful, meaningfully engage in decision-making processes. Excellent, Asul. Very good. In fact, let me let me cite an excellent example that I'm involved in. I've been invited by the UN Secretary General to be a chair of one of the five action tracks of the UN Food Systems Summit, which is going to take place in September. 
and each of us in the, the five chairs have a youth vice chair, an official vice chair, uh, who is part of our, our overall decision making and leadership team. And they play a very integral role in telling us what they want us to do. Uh, and that's extremely important. And I feel a very good innovation. So we don't just consult with them, we give them a position of power and decision making alongside the leaders uh, in the system. Um, let me now move to Ashmita Ojha from Nepal Mercy Corps. Ashmita, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do in Nepal and then uh, what you've heard so far that you think would be useful for you to take back uh, to your colleagues and the work that you are doing in Nepal. And if I could sure. ask you to be brief, because we are running sure. out of time. Sure, yeah. sorry. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Asmita Oja from Mercy Corps Nepal, and I work in the capacity of Senior Monitoring Evaluation and Knowledge Management Officer. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for this opportunity to speak in this forum. I must say it was a great learning experience for me to be in CBA 15. All the sessions, workshops, peer-to-peer -peer trainings, and the other resources available in the hotel were very knowledgeable. One of the reasons I I love this forum is that it gives the perspective from diverse people and a forum to share our experience along with connecting with uh, connecting us with like-minded people. And uh, now moving on the reflection from last three days, we all have been working in our certain geography and uh, with certain intervention for the betterment of our community. Uh, we always want to innovate and try new interventions to help community better adapt to uh, changing climate and deal with disaster. And this forum provide that exposure to multiple solution from multiple countries and scenario. So we can learn what we can do differently and how can we integrate that uh, learning to our project and working areas. Uh, there were discussions about the engagement of private sector, which has been a challenging area for the community-based adaptation. The discussion needs to be continued uh, to pull the sector in CBA. Uh, Mercy Corps has uh, also hosted a session uh, focusing on sharing our experience and engaging the private sector. And uh, we discussed that for this, we need to show um, the private sector that while making money, they can even contribute to make impact. Uh, so th that was an awesome uh, learning. Uh, so one more thing to reflect is uh, we have always considered the community as victim, but it's time to break that stereotype. The communities have uh, tested and tried many different uh, relevant, uh, many different things relevant to their context to overcome their problem. We should respect that and support to bridge the uh, complexity and challenges they may face on the words of changing climate so um, that their actions Thank are you. sustainable and community can move towards transformation. Uh, finally, I just wanted to thank CB on all the good learnings from here and love the concept of Mel and Jesse Champion. And being one of them was great for me to deep digger in session with Mel Focus. I thank want to echo some word from uh, one session that learning is only learning when it leads to change. And I, being a Mel person, want to say that we should focus on changing rather than success and failure. Let's learn to uh, celebrate failure. Let's not talk uh, about um, just meeting targets. Let's uh, uh, talk about creating impacts. Uh, that's all. Excellent. Thank you. Very, very wise words, Sachmita. Uh, I love them. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have uh, uh, Susan with us? Would you like to take the floor and tell us a little bit about yourself and what lessons you are taking back? Thank you very much. I'm um, Sarah. Sarah oh, sorry, Nandudu's Sarah. Name. Susan is yeah. the other uh, Nandudu. There are two Nandudus. Yeah. I confused. Yeah. <laughs> A mix you and unfortunately, up. unfortunately, we share one of the names with her. So maybe that's <laughs> Please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sarah Nandudu. I'm the national coordinator of the National Slum Transportation of Uganda. We are affiliated to Slum Builders International. And our work mm -hmm. is to mobilize communities in slums, informal settlements, create awareness of what their rights and their roles are their responsibility as community members, but basically we use savings as a tool to mobilize communities because savings is a backbone of someone whose life in a community, more so in the marginalized communities that are slums. We don't only do that, we also collect information about ourselves. So <clears throat> uh, back to the questions that have been given to me, there are questions that are related to the work we do. And, and I'm very happy that I've been part of this conference. A lot more has been said, which adds up to what we do. 
And majorly what I will pick out of fear is that <clears throat> the subject of adaptation. I think the subject has been there before and we there is a gap that communities may have to maybe pull up their stop with the support from other partners. Um, what I've evidently learned here is that there are innovations that communities have undertaken in relation to adaptation, climate adaptation and resiliency. However, a lot is still lacking simply because I think communities are taken as the end, end users instead of being part of. So while you're an end user, you do not have any information, but you do as they do. Even you may not understand why you're doing it, but yet you're doing the right thing. But since you are not groomed in the information, in the knowledge, you do like what others do. And this is a best practice that for us, we actually acknowledge because our process we learn by doing. Since we do not have formal classes and reading of books and what we learn by doing. So adaptation is a subject that we should put uh, emphasis to support communities to be able to take it up to scale. And not only supporting them, but let them be part and part of the process of how governments are planning to undertake some of these initiatives. Because in many instances, communities are left out. They do not have a voice to speak about what is happening, but yet in the end, they are the ones that suffer the most. So the subject needs to be taken to another level with governments to undertake. <clears throat> I also uh, got to understand a lot of things in relation to women. Actually, many times we want to think that maybe women uh, do not matter in the community as well as the youth, but evidence has shown that these people are agents of change. We are agents of change in our community. Like I mentioned, through our savings groups, we have been able to make even data collection in our settlements that has supported us even to unpack the effects of climate change issues. I have shown a, in my presentation in one of the meetings where women have an innovation of collecting waste into wealth. This is a very good innovation that women did. And that means women and the youth, if brought on board, given in knowledge, impacted information and support to transform their lives, they're able to do it. Mm -hmm. Can imagine women through their savings are able to collect right. bottles, recycle them, sell them, and get a living out of it. Mm -hmm. One, they have created a change in their lives <clears throat> by earning. Two, they are changing their environment by cleaning the drainage channels. Three, they are cleaning their environment to be clean for a living. So we need to support such innovations to be able to avert effects of climate change. Another subject I have okay. to go out with is the innovation, collaboration, and partnership. We can't do it in alone. You can't do it in ISO. We have to work in partnership. We have to collaborate, share information and knowledge. For example, communities want a lot of more information on how climate effects are happening in different countries. Mm -hmm. So there is need for us to create a platform on sharing information and knowledge. And this can only be fostered if we have strong working partnership. Absolutely. Sometimes we talk of partnership, but the partnership we're talking about are not tangible partnership. Mm -hmm. They don't uh, uh, bring out tangible results. So we need partnerships. Absolutely. Partnerships right. at local level, partnership at national level, and partnership at international level. And these have different roles they play to support different communities. Like I mentioned, we need to share best practices. Like in other countries, you find that people have come in. I am very uh, puzzled with the innovation from Zambia. The one who has just gotten an award. You can imagine. There are lots of innovations that people can take up, but we don't share information and mm -hmm. no one knows what others is doing. So right. we need to create a platform to share information across the board so that we learn from one another and we transform the environment and avert climate yeah. change. Uh, I had, Excellent. I think that's all I can mention Thanks. for now. Thank you very Great. much. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah, for those excellent suggestions. Uh, we have actually uh, reached our time limit, but I'm going to uh, give Andrew the floor for a, a couple of more minutes uh, to perhaps reflect on what you just heard, which is essentially that the people on the planet who are adapting to climate change as we speak actually know a lot about adaptation. And how can the decision makers at the highest levels in the COP, when they, for example, discuss developing a global goal on adaptation, 
actually acknowledge explicitly the knowledge that people on the ground have and bring that into such a global goal. Andrew? Thank you. Um, yeah, and really inspiring set of presentations from the other panel members, um, a lot of ideas and exactly as you say, um, a lot of knowledge. I mean, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, it's, it's events like this where we're sharing the expertise, um, um, bringing together people um, from right around the world. Um, and as you said at the start, the, the technology is actually helping us to do that at the moment. Um, and just a couple of reflections. I mean, since the endorsement of the, the principles for locally led adaptation um, in, in January, um, by the UK and others, and the um, the um, G7 foreign and development ministers actually welcome the principles as well. You're already seeing a momentum behind that. That's underlined this week. It would be underlined further by the, the regional meetings that I described. Um, and one feature of how we're wanting to prepare for the COP26 is precisely creating these spaces to listen um, and hear these ideas, hear what's working. Um, and the same um, applies with the, the global goal on adaptation, um, which is featuring in um, uh, the, the regional climate weeks being organized as opportunities to hear from countries, hear from others about how we can come together. Um, and I think this very rich set of experiences, these illustrations of how um, adaptation can work, the practical solutions should actually give us confidence behind what we're trying to achieve. There's a long way to go. It's a really huge task. Solutions are in different, uh, different in different countries um, and different contexts, but um, hopefully we are achieving by sharing information um, in, um, in meetings and events like this, and that we were determined, as Anne-Marie Trevelyan said, we want to bring these good stories, these good examples, these fantastic participants um, to COP and to the discussions. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And do give our uh, um, uh, thanks to Anne-Marie, even though she wasn't able to join us for giving us the statement. And we look forward to working with you and with her going forward. So before I end and hand over to um, uh, our colleagues in IID, uh, uh, or to uh, uh, particularly Andrew Norton, uh, to conclude this session, let me thank all the uh, panelists for some excellent uh, uh, reflections on what we've been hearing uh, about the conference itself. I feel it's been a, a, a wonderful event. And as I said earlier, being virtual has one virtue, which is we can participate from all over the world without having to fly in uh, to a country to participate, which you used to have to do before. Uh, perhaps we'll go back to those times again, but at, at least for now, we can uh, meet across the globe. Um, let me now hand over to uh, Andrew Norton, uh, the director of IID. Uh, first apologies for overrunning my time. I hope it wasn't uh, too bad. And also thank you, Andy, for uh, continuing to do the CBS series, uh, conference series. Uh, you know, I, I started them many years ago when I was with you in IID. When I left IID to move to Bangladesh, I wasn't quite sure whether you would continue them. I'm very glad to see that you have, and I hope that you've made, you feel you've made the right decision. Thank you. And over to you. Well, thanks so much, Salim. Um, and really, I'm not going to attempt to summarize. Um, it's been such a rich and diverse week with so many incredible perspectives and also such a great closing event as well. Um, so I have the, the huge task along with our indefatigable lead organizer for CBI 15, Sam Green, who I'll hand over to to finish, of saying thank you to everyone. And of course, we won't be able to name check everyone, um, but just some of the voices that have made it such a good week. Um, so let me kick off, in fact, with huge thanks to our two co-hosts for today, Aditya Bahadur and Salim. It's always special to have you with us, Salim. As you say, all this started with you when you were with IID, and it's a real privilege always to be able to learn from your incredible experience. Thank you so much. Um, also, huge thanks to the theme leads who shaped much of what you've heard through the week um, and who you heard from in Aditya's brilliant hard talk session at the top. I'm not going to go through all the names because it's just going to take too long, but huge thanks. Also to all the speakers, both in this session and throughout the CBA week, and particularly to the session hosts who put in a lot of work behind the scenes um, to create challenging and engaging sessions. So huge thanks to all of you. Let me move now to the in talking about the institutions. Um, 
kick off massive thanks to the funding partners, um, Climate Justice Resilience Fund, Irish Aid, and a little bit from my own organization, IAD. Obviously, we couldn't do this without you. Um, so huge thanks as well for your contributions, massively appreciated. Um, I also want to thank our co-hosts for organizations that are always really great to work with. And it's been a privilege to work with you on CBA 15. The Global Resilience Partnership, Care International, Practical Action, and Celine's organization, the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAD, based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Let me thank also the contributing partners, the Green Africa Youth Organization, BRAC, um, Huaru Commission, IUCN Netherlands, the African Center for Trade and Development, uh, GIZ and VSO. Again, huge thanks to you. And a special word for uh, sponsoring partners, Engen, who helped a lot to ensure that we got a wide representation of people able to participate and attend the conference. Now, let me move to the people who did all the hard work behind the scenes. Um, the programming team, a lot of them you've already heard from, so I won't repeat that. Um, but it's worth including some names who weren't in this session. Umet Tania Sultana, Dr. Rabani Golam, Chris Henderson, Jan Willem Dembesten, Jules Van Koppen, Topas Chakraborty, Joshua Aponsem, and Jennifer Kadim. Huge thanks to you for all your work. And the final words of thanks from me before I hand on to Sam to complete the thank yous to everybody who, um, who we can mention indeed in the restricted time. Um, but particular thanks to the organizing team who've put in heroic work to make this CBI so rich, diverse and successful. Uh, Teresa Saroka, the CBA program manager. Special thanks to you, Teresa, for all your brilliant work. Amy Gibson, the event manager. Um, we had Amy with us in person at a couple of CBAs. It's great to have you back, Amy, at this one. To Maya Say Manova and to Martin Cummings, two uh, colleagues of mine from IAD. And I think that's all from me. So huge thanks. It was brilliant to be part of this. And let me hand over now to Sam Green. Brilliant. Thanks, Andy. And, and thanks to everyone that's helped to put all of this together. Uh, I also just want to extend a couple of extra thank yous uh, to uh, Think Active Labs, who have created the platform uh, on which you've uh, experienced CBA over the last week. Uh, they've created it especially for us and it looks fantastic. Uh, the gender and male champions who stepped forward at pretty much uh, just a week's notice and have really organized themselves and spread themselves out uh, across lots of different sessions to uh, to report back. Thank you so much for, for stepping up. So I just want to close by sharing a couple of great opportunities that are available to CBA participants. In the chat, you'll actually see a, a link to apply for a catalytic grant, which you might remember I mentioned in the opening plenary. So maybe you were at CBA and you had a new idea and you thought, I wish I had the time and space to develop that. Maybe you were talking to somebody you hadn't spoken to before. Well, now there is funding available from GRP and with the support of ICAD to deliver that, you can click on the link that you can see in the chat. And we can also share that by email to all the, all the participants. Um, there's your opportunity to take an idea and take it forward. So please, please use this opportunity. The deadline closes in a couple of weeks. The other thing I want to share, anybody who is at CBA 13, you might remember there was a film called uh, Thank You for the Rain. Um, it's a fantastic film. I remember we watched it in Ethiopia and half of the room uh, uh, left the room in tears. Now that film is available to watch for CBA participants. So do check the email that comes out. We'll be sharing an access code so that you can get onto uh, uh, the platform and watch that film for free. It is fantastic. It's a really, really interesting watch uh, about the experience of climate hazards. Uh, um, and I absolutely recommend it. So please do check your email. And one final thing is that you can help us to make CBA 15 uh, even better uh, and CBA 16 and CBAs beyond. And it's really simple way to help us to do that 
which is to share your feedback in the feedback survey. So if you check your emails, you would be you will be able to uh, 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 to to answer some questions, give us the feedback, tell us what you think CBA should be doing more of or less of. That survey will take less than ten minutes, but it's absolutely essential for us to work out how we go forward into the next year, how we can include you all, uh, uh, and how we can continue to make CBA as good as it can possibly be and a platform and a voice for practitioners in the future. So with that, I want to thank everybody uh, uh, who has participated, uh, especially also session hosts who have come forward, collaborated with others sometimes when they didn't expect to, to create a really amazing set of sessions. Um, and uh, uh, I really hope that I get the opportunity to uh, uh, see you over the course of the year and see you again in CBAs in the future. So thank you very much, everybody. And I hope to see you again soon.